to get a third, fourth child, they would apply and the, um, the bureaucrats would basically treat it as if it were within the two visa limit. So um, they were called non-preference visas, meaning they would just have to wait at the end of the line like everyone else, but they would essentially expedite them as if they were not the third or fourth request. The second thing that, and so there's, you know, the um, congressperson who questioned the State Department official was like, so you're basically like interpreting the law that we passed, like what gives you the right to do that? But, you know, you can see already <coughs> kind of ideology that adoption is good, you know, that adoption works, people want bigger families, we should facilitate that. So um, despite concerns about the fact that, you know, these State Department folks were kind of going a bit rogue, they, they didn't really... Um, it didn't lead to any kind of, uh, you know, it didn't, it didn't prevent the amendment from passing. But the second thing that got revealed is that, uh, you know, the INS really depended a lot on the documents that they received <coughs> from adoption agencies, almost entirely. So home studies, they trusted uh, just at face value. Um, you know, the, the whole process, uh, you know, relied upon all of this kind of, these, these reports and paperwork that were generated by um, adoptive parents and adoption agencies. Um, so in, in effect, because the INS relied on all these uh, existing documents, um, there was no oversight or follow-up. So at one point, the, um, a congressperson is asking a representative from the INS, so, you know, there was actually a case where they talked about, well, has, has there ever been a situation in which you investigated a case because you didn't trust the documents? And it was, yes, there's a person who had been convicted of child molestation. And, uh, you know, um, so we investigated. But then we got a report from their psychiatrist, and it had been a long time ago, and so we approved it. And then the congressperson said, did you follow up? And they said, no because it really wasn't in their jurisdiction. Their jurisdiction was provide a visa, and then, then it's left to whomever else. So, you know, those are the kinds of things get, that get revealed, which are quite telling. But one thing that I want to point out here is this particular exchange where this Democratic uh, representative from Pennsylvania says, what, is, what does INS do if the adoption does not take place? <coughs> Um, and this is, this is pointing out how INS is only about visas, right? So children enter it on visas, but the adoption is finalized separately under state, in the state courts under family law. So the INS will provide a visa, but they have no idea if the adoption was ever finalized. So, or if the child ever got citizenship. So the representative says, what does INS do if the adoption does not take place? INS official says, after we've approved the petition and after a child has come here, yes. We don't do anything, sir. We don't even have that information. And he's like, shouldn't you have that? He says, I'm not sure, I, I'm sure we don't have that information. And he says, my question is, shouldn't you have it? Shouldn't somebody have it? So you can see there are these major gaps in the way that adoption is being governed. And yet the number of classes, it leads to the kinds of photos that the photo documentation that Kim showed us, these ever larger families. Um, and, you know, of course, within the cultural domain, it's this kind of celebration of multiculturalism and, and UN families, etc. But on the remaining slides, I just want to show um, the ways, the particular ways in which, and this, the, the disjointed process is, the, is a phrase from a uh, legal scholar whose uh, um, quote I'll show you in a second. But this is, this is the kind of way in which things were really kind of um, the jurisdiction and the um, the kinds of policy decisions were sort of um, siloed and separated across various uh, spaces within government. So you had foreign courts, say in Korea, determining whether the relinquishment was legal. U.S. state courts determining whether the adoption was legal under family law, and state courts meaning like in each individual 50, you know, the 50 states. U.S. Immigration and Naturalization Service, or INS, determines the visa entry and citizenship eligibility. Mm -hmm. U.S. State Department determines eligibility of a child to be adopted by U.S. citizens. And, um, you know, so I'll just read this quote first. This is uh, Richard Carlson, the immigration uh, expert, writing in 1988 about this, saying, despite the interdependence of the foreign relinquishment, United States immigration and state adoption processes 
Each is governed by entirely separate bodies of law. As a result, the law and process of transnational adoption remains disjointed. Most transnational adoptions succeed despite the lack of forthright law, but the failure of lawmakers to provide a clear process creates unnecessary risks and uncertainties. So this is, again, the period in which adoption in Korea is basically unregulated, adoption in the US is basically unregulated, and, I mean, it's, you know, what, what, is, what is the implication of all of this? You get what we have now. Adoptees whose adoptions were never finalized, adoptees whose, who were never um, naturalized, adoptees whose adoptions were not finalized and they were not naturalized, um, etc. So ultimately, I guess, you know, the, the message is, who did know about this, right? Who had the information? And the answer is pretty clear, it's adoption agencies, right? They were the ones who were able to <laughs> navigate, it was their job to navigate between sending countries and receiving countries. And they were the ones who understood this disjointed process. They were the ones who were provided the glue or the channels for the disjointed process to work. So I think it's really um, important for us to understand you know, the, um, certainly the political economy, the cultural dimensions, but, you know, for all these adoptions to have been possible, it wasn't just, I mean, we'll learn about the Korean side, right, where, you know, there were social and political forces, but you needed states to receive and to allow for the legal system to work to, to make it possible for thousands and thousands of children to enter the country legally, but then, of course, producing all of these uh, really um, disturbing and um, really unjust gaps. So um, the last thing I'll say, I don't know how much time is there. Okay, uh, maybe a couple more things then is, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> so much to say. But uh, is that, uh, you know, as we learn about Korea, on the Korean end legally, this is also the time in which, um, you know, the state was essentially um, outsourcing social welfare uh, needs to adoption agencies. So adoption agencies were, set, were told, you can send children overseas if you provide services for single women, if you support disabled children. So they were using the money from foreign adoptions to fund all of these institutions that the state was not providing. Um, and this is the kind of um, machinery that was being built in South Korea. And you might say, well, maybe people in the US didn't know that that was happening, right? But there were lots of very critical social workers at the time mm. doing work in Korea and saying, this doesn't seem right. Mm -hmm. You know, we know that these are poor children, they're not orphans, they're being funneled into this kind of institutional system that is taking a load off of the government, which is just kind of doing this super rapid industrialization at, you know, on the backs of poor people, you know, this isn't right. And so there were, um, you know, publications that, you know, we have evidence that these publications were read by adoption agency social workers in the U.S. who found it troubling because they were being critical of the way that this whole system was operating. So, um, but in the House um, committee hearings, you know, you don't have representatives, or you, I'm sorry, you don't have testimony from critical folks, right? You have testimony from parents, you have testimony from, uh, parent, you know, parent groups or social workers who say, oh, Korea, and, you know, because the vast majority of children were still coming from Korea at that time, you know, saying, oh, you know, we need to allow Americans who want to adopt more children from Korea to adopt them, because things are so awful in Korea, et cetera. You have all these children who, um, Need homes, and you know. So I think that again, you know, the evidence is there for how these gaps were produced uh, through um, blindnesses and negligence of the existing um, situation. Okay, so I just want to end very quickly because you know this the the, the article that uh, Kim and I have uh, co-authored also it's really focused around this gap that Kim talked about between kin kinship and citizenship in the way that the law had always uh, framed international adoptees. And we see that as kind of providing the foundation for the illegalization of adoptees now. So this, these are just a few slides outlining the history. Again, I know it's supposed to be 70s and 80s today, but it's a little bit 90s, 2000s. <laughs> just to bring it up to the present, because I think a lot of you may have questions about why it is that adoptees are being subject to removal and deportation. 
So legally, in the 1990s, you had the kind of uh, really draconian anti-immigration laws coming into effect. Um, these were the laws that uh, basically made it possible to um, not only criminalize immigrants, but um, use past crimes to, as the basis for deportation. And this is when the first adults started being deported as adults because of various kinds of crimes. And um, adoptive parents were highly disturbed by this. They lobbied Congress people. They got the 2000 Child Citizenship Act passed. Uh, but as many of you know, there was this loophole which only permitted adoptees who were 18 at the time of its um, installment to be protected. And everyone else who had come before was not. So the, the adoptees who we know about, like Adam Crafter, um, who have been deported, uh, you know, were not covered by this law. So now, and I think a lot of people in the room have been involved in this issue as well, you have adoptees who are working to lobby Congress to pass the Adoptee Citizenship Act to close that loophole. And um, this is a, just a kind of uh, brief history of, of the act, which is still under discussion. There are more and more state legislatures mm -hmm. which have embraced uh, the, um, the goals of the ACA. And ultimately, you know, I think we want to provoke a conversation about, you know, what, what is the, um, what are the interests and um, sort of um, agendas of adoptees in terms of thinking about this history as um, non-immigrant immigrants, right? People who, from other countries who are allowed into the country and then um, are finding themselves in this strange space of being completely accepted as fully American and yet falling short of citizenship. So what, where does it place uh, the current discussion in terms of adoptee citizenship? and uh, identity as immigrants. So I think I'll 